Hello, welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker at Octo. Um, we are very pleased that you are here today um, for a presentation on Urban Ocean, um, partnering to advance clean, healthy cities for clean, healthy seas. Uh, we have three presenters here today. We have Carrie Browder from um, the Ocean Conservancy, Steve Morrison from NOAA, and Jenna Jambeck from the University of Georgia. Before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, the format of the webinar will have an initial presentation by Carrie, Steve, and Jenna, and then we'll have a uh, dedicated time, uh, about 20 minutes, for question and answer. Uh, the, you send in questions by typing them into the user the user interface into the questions panel, and then I'll be moderating the questions uh, to, to our panelists. Um, again, welcome, uh, Carrie, and Steve, and Jenna. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very, er, thank you very much, Sarah. It's good to be here. My name is Carrie Browder, and as Sarah said, I uh, work at Ocean Conservancy and am the city's project director and lead for the Urban Ocean Program. Today, we'll be joined by our partners in this program. First, Steve Morrison, who leads the International Activities and Partnerships Coordination for the Marine Debris Division at NOAA, and Dr. Jenna Jambeck, who works for the uh, University of Georgia's New Materials Institute and Circulitics Lab and is a professor there as well. First, we'll start off with Steve. Steve, if you'd like to, um, hold on, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, Carrie, uh, yeah. The, oh yeah, the slides are moving down, great. Hi everybody, I'm, as Carrie said, I'm Steve Morrison. I'm with the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Marine Debris Program um, based outside Washington, D.C. And I, I'm really happy to be here today just basically to help highlight some of the work of one of our partners at Ocean Conservancy and in particular their great work through their Urban Ocean um, Program. NOAA has been extremely pleased to support this work over the past couple of years with a grant and been really impressed with what's been produced so far and know there's great things to come. And just especially considering that this work has all been basically all been undertaken during the pandemic. Um, I think it's been really impressive to see. Um, so no, no small feat. Um, so I'll be turning things over to back to Carrie um, at Ocean Conservancy and Dr. Jenna Jambeck from the Uni University of Georgia soon. But um, while I have you all here, just wanted to give a very brief uh, overview of NOAA's Marine Debris Program and the work that we do uh, to address the topic. Thank you. So the NOAA Marine Debris Program was established by the US Congress in 2006 to identify, determine sources, assess, prevent, reduce, and remove marine debris. Our program has been reauthorized three times since then with new legislation. And most relevant, I think, for this uh, talk today uh, were the, um, the Save Our Seas Act from 2018 and the Save Our Seas Act 2 in 2020, as these really kind of recognize the important role the U.S. government has to play and our partners in working more globally and internationally to address this issue. So that was kind of the first recognition of that in the Save Our Seas uh, law, and then Save Our Seas 2 really expanded that. Um, for across the U.S. government. So, but most of NOAA's program is almost uh, entirely focused domestically. Um, but of course, we recognize, you know, and value the importance of working collaboratively on the international stage and happy to be working with Ocean Conservancy to do so. Uh, the vision of our program at NOAA is the global ocean and its coast free from the impacts of marine debris. And our mission is to investigate and prevent adverse impacts of marine debris. And we do this through uh, implementing six uh, program pillars, we call them, or our general themes. And these are on, and I'll walk through these in the next slides, but these are on marine debris prevention, removal, research, monitoring and coordination, uh, emergency response, um, sorry, uh, monitoring and detection and, and coordination. So thanks for the, advancing the slides, um, keeping me moving here. <laughs> uh, um, so our most important priority, um, of course, is preventing marine debris from occurring in the first place. And this, this is what we focus a lot of our work on. And to implement this work, we run a national competitive grants program 
the MIES grants fund local level um, prevention projects that aim to reduce marine debris at its source. So a, a lot of these, most of these projects are around um, seeking to raise awareness of the issue and to create lasting changes in behavior that can reduce marine debris. And so just as an example, you know, some of these projects can be working to, um, you know, on a local level to, to, to incentivize the use of a reusable bag instead of a single use one or switching from, you know, disposable foodware to reusable alternatives. So those types of projects, but a lot more. And there's, there's a lot of information on our website to check it out. Um, also for pre prevention, we provide a number of educational resources on our website, you know, for the, for the general public. Um, for educators in particular. And so that's, there's a lot of helpful stuff there just to raise awareness and to help change behaviors on the issue. And then for our removal priority, we also implement a national grant competition. Uh, and these fund community-based marine debris removal projects around the US. So some types of like beach shoreline cleanups to like large scale there like gear cleanup. And in addition to, to that competition, we also support um, funding to a large marine debris cleanup in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, so over since our program uh, started in 2006, we funded over 160 projects, um, removing over 22,000 metric tons of debris. But of course, just a drop in the ocean when we consider how much um, marine debris is in the ocean. So next slide, please. Our next pillar is on uh, research. And so to better understand the issue and its impacts on the environment, we fund a suite of research projects, usually every other year um, with partners. And this is through another competitive grants program. So these projects um, focus on different things. So they, they focus on helping us understand like how marine debris is transported throughout the ocean and coastal environment and where it ends up. So fate and, and distribution and things like that, as well as um, things like uh, better understanding the impacts of marine debris to things like commercial seafood species and to, to whether exposure to, to plastics and chemicals can harm wildlife, as well as understanding the economic impacts of debris on coastal communities and, and industry. Um, for our monitoring and detection work, we implement a marine debris monitoring and assessment project since about, we've been implementing it since about 2012. This project provides tools and guidelines to monitor marine debris in shoreline environments. So this is really a citizen science initiative that engages our partners and volunteers in using a standardized um, monitoring protocol to survey and record marine debris. So it's open to anyone and the tools and training information are all on our website. Um, and so users can also upload any data they collect through the protocol and they can into the to a NOAA's database from our website and they can then use it to visualize different scenarios and display the data um, to their needs. Next slide, please. So we understand that most of the action to address marine debris is on the local level. And so we have staff from our program in 10 regions around the country to facilitate regional coordination. Um, these staff help implement local activities and they partner with key entities to combat marine debris on the local level. Um, the coordinators also lead and facilitate the development of regional or state, US state marine debris action plans. And we've created or we've facilitated the creation of 12 of these plans for, for you know, on the subnational level within the US to date. Um, and these, these action plans are really important, I think, for understanding you know, the local framework for addressing marine debris. And of course, for spurring collaboration and for prioritizing action at the local level. And these, you know, these are living, they're living documents in the sense that there's a lot of work that goes into implementing them once they're finished. And then they're revised usually every five years. And they're very, it's done through a very collaborative process, though. So they're really helpful for kind of understanding the issue at a local level and then taking action to address it. And then for coordination, we also work across the US government and internationally. Then on our sixth pillar, um, which is on emergency response, and this is for addressing debris that is that results from severe, you know, usually weather events, things like hurricanes and floods and big storms. So we work with states to prepare for and respond to severe marine debris, severe marine debris events from these storms, and we develop specific response guides 
for individual states, and we work closely with those local response communities and our federal partners to do so. Uh, next slide, please. So we couldn't implement our national program at NOAA without many partnerships. Um, and partnerships are really important when addressing the all the many aspects of the issue of marine debris and plastic pollution. It touches on so many parts of our life and you know, economic sectors and, and everything. So at the local and state level, you know, we're working through with, with local partners, you know, funding local grants um, for project implementation on our prevention and removal work. We have our regional coordinators stationed around the country um, to help you know, spur local action, and then they're also developing and implementing marine debris action plans, and we have our emergency response guides that help um, responders in, in times of um, you know, severe marine debris events. And then on the national level, we're really setting national priorities for these grant competitions every year or every other year, um, as well as we maintain a project clearinghouse on our website, um, which is something very interesting to check out and has a lot of good information on past funded projects by NOAA. We also implement our shoreline monitoring project, and we chair the uh, Interagency Marine Debris Coordinating Committee, which is a um, coordinating committee that helps coordinate the US federal response to marine debris. And then at the international level, um, we work, of course, with colleagues across the interagency and support the US State Department, as an example, in developing US foreign policy on addressing marine debris in addition to working directly with foreign governments and with and through multilateral institutions also to understand and to address marine debris. And um, for international work, we've been really pleased to contribute to Ocean Conservancy over the last two years, as I said, to help fund the Urban Ocean Program. Um, and this has been a great program of helping to build waste management capacities in urban settings to reduce marine pollution. I think, you know, what's obvious, I think, is working at the city level on this issue is so valuable as there are many aspects um, of marine debris and, you know, and solid waste that are addressed at the city or municipal scale. It's also helpful, I think, for tailoring, you know, specific interventions to more local conditions. Working at that level, you know, a lot of times, especially, you know, internationally, or, or I guess this is true, you know, from the developing world to the developed, a lot of times there's a lack of a national framework for addressing solid waste. Um, and so working working at cities is a really important level uh, for this issue. Um, next slide, please. And so that was all I had for this. Just wanted to give a quick um, rundown of our program at NOAA. There's the information if you'd like to check us out a little bit more. And with that, I will turn it back to Carrie. Thank you, Steve. Um, I will now sort of go into the Urban Ocean Program in more detail. We'll start with this photo. Um, unfortunately, I think we've all gotten used to seeing images like this, whereas a few years ago, uh, we didn't see them as much. If you're close enough to the ocean, we could all relate to seeing bits of plastic, small and large, and we're really trying to raise awareness around the world of the issue that we're seeing. Um, it's really hard to fully grasp and imagine, but unabated ocean plastic will reach 250 million tons by 2025. And Jenna will go into the details of the work that she is doing, but just the recent science is showing us that this is, it's only continuing to grow. And if unabated, um, it's, it's literally choking our ocean, both the um, animals that we see, but also the organisms uh, in, in, mi in micro sizes. So um, over 80% of the ocean plastic comes from land-based sources. So we really need to do all we can to um, stop plastic at the source before it reaches the ocean in the first place. Another issue is uh, human health concerns. Um, as, as, we, as we are going to discuss here, there are various places around the world that are really struggling with their waste management, not by their own fault necessarily, but because we all contribute to waste. So whether it's um, generated here, sometimes we ship it overseas, and of course it's generated locally as well. So we really need to band together, not only for the sake of the ocean environment, but just the lives and the communities that depend 
um, that depend on our ocean. So as Steve started to say, we decided the best solution would be to engage local government. Why urban ocean? As we said, cities are sort of at the are, are at the forefront of trying to build circular economies, and municipalities are typically the ones responsible for municipal waste management. They also are, are striving for co-benefits for their communities, whether that's economic development and job creation, improving health, preserving tourism. And so we thought that connecting the ocean to our lives and cities was critical to addressing the problem. It's also important from a policy issue and to foster future investment. So we wanted to tackle different ways of, of handling the problem and create a multifaceted approach. And we also thought there was a great way for cities to learn from other cities. So as we'll see in the next slide, really focused on building a global community behind a common cause. So um, our approach uh, has, lent, has led us to 11 cities over the course of about 20 months. We consider ourselves one community. And at the end of this four, first cohort, we'll be implementing six projects in cities in Southeast Asia and in Latin America. Our plan is to build this coalition and to expand it so we can address interrelated problems associated with um, plastic waste. Uh, giving the cities the tools to assess their, their own particular challenges because every city is different. And from that, cities will have the capacity and the data to build solutions that, are, that, that will meet the needs of their particular city and their, and, their, and their population. And hopefully, as time goes on, we'll continue to build a platform where other cities around the world can learn grow and challenge one another to tackle this plastic challenge together. We've broken this up into learning cities and mentor cities. Learning cities being those that have self-selected, that wanted to be part of this program and thought that they could really stand to learn and grow. And then mentor cities who feel that they have a better handle on how they manage municipal solid waste and feel like they have something to give to support our cities. So our cities are uh, Kanto, Malacca, Semarang. We have two in India, both Pune and Chennai, and Panama City. And our mentor cities are Toyama, Christchurch, Milan, Pune, Rotterdam, and Vile. I just wanted to flag Pune. They're both a learning city and a mentor city because of their experience working with informal waste workers and could stand as a mentor to some of our other cities who want to know how to better support the informal waste sector and those who participate in it. Our collaborators uh, obviously are uh, Dr. Jenner Jambeck and the um, University of Georgia. She will go into detail about our local implementation partners, which we're very proud of. And then we have our funders here as well. This gives you an idea of the timeline of the program. Of course, we did experience some delays due to COVID. However, I really want to stress that it was amazing to see how um, patient and dedicated our cities were. After the um, pandemic really sent us all you know, to stay inside and we couldn't travel, we gave the, uh, the cities the opportunity to decline the program because we knew that they would be focused on so many other things impacting their cities and all of the cities so that they would remain committed and patient as we, as we figured out how to implement on the ground. So um, it was, it's, it's encouraging. And as someone who's really passionate about something in this space, it continues to fuel my fire and in knowing that um, all of us globally are dedicated to the same cause. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jambeck, and she's going to talk to you about the research portion for the Learning Cities and the Circularity Assessment Protocol. Jenna, please go ahead. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I was just reflecting quickly while both you and Steve were talking um, about, you know, sort of the history. So I was working with NOAA uh, at the inception of the program of the Marine Debris Program in 2006 and also collaborating with Ocean Conservancy in 2001 when I first started working on this issue. So just kind of a long history here in terms of collaboration. And before I jump into the content, I really want to acknowledge my amazing team 
uh, especially Taylor Madeline, who uh, is the director of our CAP program within the Circularity Informatics Lab. Um, but just we even have, you know, undergrad students who contribute to this amazing work. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Next slide. So what is the circularity assessment protocol? Well, it was, it was born out of when um, I was having discussions sort of at the global level, seeing CVET meetings and, you know, we're talking about, you know, how to address plastic pollution and, you know, the circular economy came up. Um, it sounded, you know, conceptually sounded amazing. And there were a few sort of examples of implementation. But being an environmental engineer, and then the other activity I was doing was traveling with the State Department and visiting communities around the world and talking about this issue. And they would say, what should we do? And they're really at the front lines. And I was trying to figure out how to associate the circular economy with a community. And that's really how the, the CAP was born. So it's this hub and spoke model. Um, I'm going to talk about each little spoke in detail in the next slide. But some of the drivers, if you think about this, it is a complex system, are policies that are either national or local policies, the economics of that system, and then the governance. And then all of us uh, community members are influencers within this system. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about um, sort of each one of these spokes of the model. And I'll start with input. For input, um, we look at what products are sold in the community and where do they originate on the community spoke. And just uh, this is a mixed methods approach. So we have both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, so for the community, we're looking at what kinds of conversations are happening around this issues. What are some stakeholders attitudes and perceptions for product design? What materials are used? Um, how are they used? Are there in any innovations available in the community? For youth, we're primarily looking at single use versus reuse options. So you can see this is much more than just a solid waste assessment. This is a holistic way of looking at the community. Um, for the materials management side, we look at both collection and end of cycle. Um, pushing that sort of verbiage to the end of cycle, not end of life. You know, how can we get to be more circular within the system? And then the leakage component, which definitely Seeing what ends up in the environment gives us information on what we can do, hopefully, to prevent that throughout the system. So next slide. So as Carrie mentioned, um, you know, and Steve, we, we did this work all during the pandemic. So it's like as soon as these projects were supposed to start, we couldn't travel. Um, and so we found amazing local implementation partners who, when they were able with regulations, could go out and collect all the data, do all the field work. We were able to interface and train them uh, virtually. And it was an amazing collaborative effort. And they brought even more to the table than I think, um, well, I mean, of course, we could have traveled and had interaction in person. But they just really brought a lot to this table and were an important component of the entire project and they are co-collaborators on the reports, et cetera. So within the um, six collaborators within the five different countries. Next slide, yeah. So just a quick overview um, by the numbers. We worked in six cities. We had six local implementation partners. Um, in terms of litter items, over 27,000 through sampling convenience items, how they were packaged. You can see some of that on the right. This is how we figure out where products are from, how they're packaged, over 1,300. Oh, uh, nearly 500 to-go items were sampled. In terms of interviews, those are semi-structured qualitative interviews, over 144, or 144 of those were conducted, and then we sampled 146 restaurants and food vendors. The way we approach sampling for this is uh, stratified, randomized sampling. So these are just the six maps of the cities on how it's broken down. Um, through a land scan population count, we have three turtiles, and then we have random locations picked within one kilometer uh, square areas that we characterize. Next slide. So I'm going to go through sort of each spoke. This is the input spoke. Um, and what we want to do is 
sample sort of the most popular brands within various categories. And by most popular, it's either based upon shelf space taken up or um, talking to the, the shopkeeper, um, owner, manager, et cetera. And so what we're trying to do here is when we're looking at what's available, that's what people have to purchase and use, and those are the materials that need to be managed. So looking at the location of both where this item is manufactured and then the parent company allows us to look at where conversations can be had if the, the packaging is problematic or if there are issues or we want to discuss circularity with these stakeholders. I think you can see in many of the cities here um, outside of Semarang and Pune, uh, parent companies are much further away than the manufacturers. Manufacturers mean we could have a lot of local conversations. Luckily, much of that is local, but um, bringing, you know, multinational um, companies to the table for these conversations is important as well. Next slide. And then this is measuring the materials that are the packaging for the convenience items. So, um, you can see here that the majority of these pie charts are multi-layer plastic film packaging, and that's really what we see. Um, the other thing, you're not going to read every single one of these pie charts. The other thing I wanted to point out in some of the larger cities, we see uh, a wider variety of materials and packaging that are coming in. And sort of when you're thinking about recycling or managing a material, it's actually better to have fewer uh, or less variety, right? Because in terms of economy of scale, you want to have, um, you know, just fewer materials to be able to manage different materials. And so you can see some of those would be more challenging as the pie charts have more and more segments within them. Next slide. The same thing um, for to-go items. You can see a bit more variety in both Chennai and Pune. Um, looking at these materials, oftentimes these are more rigid. So if you're going to get food in a takeaway container, sometimes it's more rigid. Some of these are more recyclable. So we see a bit more uh, PET in, in these pie charts um, and recyclable materials. Next slide, please. Here are some uh, quotes, I think, from the community just to illustrate a few of the themes that come out. So we do a thematic analysis in uh, the semi-structured interview data. Um, and these are themes that have come through that this is a multi-generational problem um, and that people know that we need to talk to um, this generation and think about the next generation and how we can make change. Um, the other thing I think this hotel employee was really interesting that even though people, uh, they want to offer these alternatives to plastic, people are requesting plastic. People are used to it, they like it for a certain reason. And so even so, they said, we are trying to move away from plastic, but we find our customers are requesting it. So we have to meet those needs. Um, uh, and again, I think another one about the generational differences um, that I think we saw that in many cases, youth were really, um, trying to make a difference on this issue and, and had an entrepreneurial spirit even about trying to make change. Um, during Corona, the waste management systems were, you know, very challenged, um, especially the informal recycling sector. They were saying nobody wanted to buy their material. Um, and then they have challenges anyway in terms of, you know, they're not formalized. So you can see there's a business consultant saying that, you know, that needs to be formalized so they can be recognized and have things like space and um, logistics. You can see that person says, I need to be able to expand. I could do more, but I can't expand. Um, and also waste segregation has come through in a lot of these. That is the key um, to making sort of this materials management profitable. Next slide. For the um, aspect of materials collection and management, we just have some, some photos here. There are certainly some similarities, but then also some differences. I'm fascinated with how we manage materials around the world. Um, and I think, you know, in general, we want to collect, capture, and, and contain, but that, that can look different um, everywhere we go. But there's certainly some learnings uh, from each other to be had here. Next slide. 
This is the litter density. So we walk in a hundred meter long and one meter wide transect. And so this is the compiled data from all of the cities. And you can see the most frequent number of litter items that are found per square meter is about 0.7 somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7. So if you were walking that 100 meter long transect, which is about the length of a city block, you would see 50 to 70 items um, within that length. And that's the density sort of that we're, that we're talking about here that's most, the most frequent. But you can see, similar to other environmental data, it's skewed to the right, um, which is interesting. And so sort of as we go over, over time and add more data to this, we can, we can kind of see where we're, where we're looking in terms of the most frequent concentration and then how we can, of course, prevent that in the first place. Next slide. What we're seeing on the ground in terms of characterization, um, it's about 50%, well, it's 70% plastic, but 50% of that is food-related plastic and tobacco products. Um, we also see plastic fragments, and you can see paper is even up there a lot. We see typically, um, when we were going out in the field, I would see lots of paper receipts and paper flyers and things within the litter. Um, the other thing that has really come up, um, and we're seeing this, actually this average, no matter where we are in the world, one to 2% of the litter is now PPE, and that's either a mask glove or wipe. Um, and that's pretty consistent around the world now since we've been wearing that for COVID. Um, I also want to mention we use the Open uh, Data Marine Debris Tracker app, which NOAA originally funded um, back in 2009, so, um, or 2010 was funded. And so anyway, that's the data that we collect through the leakage component is completely open to everybody. Next slide. So you can kind of see, um, this gets interesting as we sort of dive into the specific items that are found in each community. And I can, and I want to just quick give three guiding questions that, that you can think of as we collect sort of this really specific data about what we're finding. You know, what is it that we're finding? How did it get here? So as we collect data for, from this whole complex system, we can kind of reflect how do we how do we think this got here um, and being real specific about what we find helps with that. And then the third thing is what can we do about it? And that of course leads to the next steps um, throughout this process. But here I think it's really interesting to look at the top three cities, uh, Kanta, Malacca and Semarang and see that they have the same top two items, but then Pune, Panama City and Chennai are different. Um, and so, you know, again, you've got some, some similarities and some differences to be dis discussed among the cities. Um, interesting, you know, tobacco products are usually at the top, um, but in India, there are tobacco sachets that, that we saw in other work that we conducted there as well. And so I think it depends uh, upon if people are using more tobacco sachets or cigarettes with what you'll see up, up towards the top. Next slide. So I wanted to go through, this is a lot of text on a slide, just a few of these, some of the common challenges that we're seeing across the cities. Um, top convenience items, so particularly chip and candy products, um, that multi-layer plastic film material is really uh, leaking out of the system. It's difficult to collect and capture. It doesn't have value uh, in the recycling market, which means it doesn't have value on the informal sector as well, and so that tends to be leaking out. Um, you know, economics of this system, single-use plastic to-go items are consistently cheaper, they're more readily available than alternatives, so cost and convenience are really cited as a top barrier to change among consumers and business owners. Um, as I mentioned, people were asking for plastic. Um, I think demand for programs that would get young and tech savvy locals engaged in the waste sector as well as new technology uh, could also help support the informal sectors. Um, and as we're seeing space, capacity, technology, and, and manpower for existing waste collection and management infrastructure is a challenge. Um, I think especially collection, transportation, space for sorting, um, and addressing some of the aging systems that are still in place. 
And then um, acknowledging the importance of the informal sector, but not sure how to be inclusive. How do you uh, bring them into a system if you're expanding the infrastructure? And there's a lot of amazing NGOs and groups that are working to help with this um, as well. And so changing that system, but being inclusive about it is a common challenge. Next slide. And so definitely some strengths that we that we saw across the cities, um, having those domestic manufacturers um, and even some of the parent companies for some of the cities, very local, um, provides an opportunity for engagement to talk about extended producer responsibility, you know, to talk about packaging and, and how that might be able to be changed or made more circular within a local economy. Um, innovations to maximize collections, so collaborations between the formal and informal, so that was a challenge, but we know it's certainly an opportunity. Um, and we did see sort of relatively small but very enthusiastic groups that support refill and reuse stations and bulk stores and alternative delivery. There were some examples across many of the cities where um, that they are completely avoiding waste in the first place, which is, of course, the best thing to do. And that goes with a bullet that's two down from that. They have historical context of reusable and alternatives. So sort of not necessarily going backwards, but being able to be used to that and then maybe using technology to help facilitate it like RFRD or uh, mobile apps that can facilitate that. There's definitely an energized younger generation within these cities. Um, and um, although there's differing implementation, there are policies, both national and regional uh, policy strategies and frameworks in, in some of these countries and, and localities as well. Um, and a lot of interest in awareness campaigns that can help inform the community how to properly sort and handle waste um, and, and according to local protocols and then policies and enforcement are coupled with that. And high amounts of organic waste across the board, we saw that that's a huge opportunity to divert that to a composting or other organic waste management infrastructure and create a much cleaner um, recycle stream um, for, for that increasing that value. So that source segregation um, is, could be a common strength across everybody. And I think now Carrie's going to talk about next steps so that um, what they can do with this data now and how they can move forward. Yes, absolutely. If you don't mind, Jenna, I'm actually going to go back to one of your slides for my transition sure. because I think it's a great way to sort of capture what we're yeah. seeing. So um, thank you, Jenna. Uh, now, at this point, now that the cities are able to understand where their strengths lie and where opportunities are for improvement, we have been collaborating with our partner, the Resilient Cities Network, partners these cities with the mentor cities to try to build plans that they can implement in the coming years to tackle these particular challenges. And what's great to see um, in these plans, we're calling them opportunity statements, is the, the cities have really taken what they've learned to heart. And throughout this process, we've also been having capacity building sessions to teach them about um, successful campaigns, successful policy solutions and successful technologies that we've seen in other places around the world. And so to provide examples, we have um, particular cities who want to uh, target cigarette butt litter and how to engage the community in making sure that cigarette butts don't end up on the street, but they end up in trash cans. Different types of campaign to, campaigns to engage youth as well as uh, policy reforms, such as extended producer responsibility, and investing in feasibility studies to expand their infrastructure, whether it is for sorting recyclables and processing the plastic waste, or um, increasing infrastructure for things like composting, as Jenna mentioned. So um, all of this will culminate in something that we're calling an accelerator summit in April, where we will invite interested parties and partners to meet the cities, hear about the opportunities, and find ways to either collaborate or um, provide funding to the cities to make their, um, their plans a reality. Another way that we're trying to bring best practices to the greater community is through the Urban Ocean Toolkit, which is a toolkit um, that we composed over the past two years 
that brings together all the different lessons that we've learned throughout this process, as well as all the great resources that we've found outside of our partnerships that we think could be applied in other places around the world. We tackle the most, uh, the newest science behind plastic debris and microplastics, as well as um, ocean-based plastics, such as lost and abandoned fishing gear, also known as ghost gear. We do highlights on recent technologies that we've seen put in place, as well as opportunities for financial support to uh, implement different types of projects and programs in the future. And so we'll have um, a, uh, the link at the end of this webinar if you would like to try it out, but it is an interactive tool that we're really proud of and hope that we can share in the future with those who are interested from a city perspective, but also just to those who are interested in just building healthier communities. Next, we would like to discuss sort of what we see for the future. And we decided that um, because we feel that this has been successful and we have heard a lot of positive feedback from the cities, we would like to expand into a phase two or what we're calling a second cohort. We hope to launch this um, later this year with uh, more cities in Southeast Asia and in Latin America. And then who knows, a year or so from now, we're, out, we're hoping that we can also expand to other continents as well. We think this is an opportunity to grow the network and to really have an impact and then to provide uh, value across what we call resilience dividends that isn't just about the waste management itself, but also important resilience goals that um, the cities have and strengthen their voices on an international stage. And then um, uh, we look forward to your questions. If you're interested in contacting me about learning more about the city's opportunity statements or how you can support cities in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. We also have a lot of resources about our program on that website. I just wanna thank our speakers again and Octo for hosting us today. I especially want to highlight the dedication of our cities, which we're so proud of, and how we are really happy to be collaborating with our partners, the Resilient Cities Network and the Circulate Initiative. And we wanna thank you all for uh, taking the time today to join us and hope that we can find new ways to collaborate to build clean, healthy cities for clean, healthy seas. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, we really appreciate you coming today to present. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone before we get to the questions, um, we have some questions, but uh, you can send in other questions by typing them into the question panel, and I'll uh, read, read them to our, our presenters today. Okay, to get us started, um, there was a question, Jenna, that some of the data you presented, are they published already? Yes, um, I dropped the link to the, uh, all of the full reports that are, that are available on our Circularity Informatics website. So that link is in the chat. Um, that's all of the, all of the data that I presented is, is within those reports. It's not, I presented more of a sort of a metadata analysis in sort of comparing them. So like the combined histogram isn't in there yet. Um, we're, we're working with all the collaborators um, to write a paper for publication that combines all of the data. Um, but the, um, the individual reports that go into much more detail about each city are available on that website. Okay. And in our, in our, oh, and in our follow-up, we can provide the links to everything as well. Okay, great. Um, thank you guys. Okay, there was a question that came in to, um, and I'll direct it toward uh, Jenna. Um, why do you say that PET is recyclable? All credible data shows that it is not recyclable in non-OECD countries. In the US, less than 18% of all PET packaging is recyclable. Wouldn't it be more productive to state that plastic is not recyclable? Yeah, I think, I think what we're talking about here is like differences between contexts. So certainly um, in some areas, I mean, this is so technically it is. And then there, and then you have the reality sort of of the markets. Um, but just based upon what we've seen. So if we're, we're measuring that leakage component and we see it for sale in the stores, then we know that it is, you know, being uptaken by that 
by the system. Um, and so that's what we're measuring here. Uh, one example I can give you um, from another project that we did, we collected about 80,000 data points from litter items and about 0.7% of those were PET bottles. Those were along the Ganges River. And so um, certainly those are being collected now what they're being made into, what you uh, want to define that, you know, recycling as. Um, are they going bottle to bottle? Probably in many cases, that is not the case. Um, I have seen that done in Norway um, and, and a few other places, but, but typically, so if you're talking about recycling and downcycling, sort of that's another conversation we can certainly have. Um, I think what we're talking about now in terms of looking at it, individual products um, in uh, the new framework of, of un, unnecessary, avoidable, and problematic plastics, and those might be defined based upon your place. Um, if you look at the Panama City data, plastic bottles are actually number five. Nowhere else are they number five in the leakage component. And so I know the market there is less for PET. Um, and so, you know, there is this variability by place. And I, I, I know there's other countries or localities where there's absolutely no market. And of course, then they cannot be handled or managed by that system. Um, and so what we're trying to do is match sort of what comes in and what can be managed from that regard. And so, you know, that context is very different. I mean, the, the recycling for plastic globally is still less than 10%. Um, and we're at 8.7% in the US. And, you know, there are specific statistics for PET um, as well. But that sort of, I think, addresses that from, um, you know, the context specific uh, framing. Great. Thank you, Jenna. Um, a question that I, I'm sure many people have, um, how do you select the city's towns to include uh, within this effort network, specifically for future cities that will join the network? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the cities in this case self-selected. So all of them were part of the Resilient Cities Network to begin with. However, um, cities uh, have the opportunity to prioritize what they wanna work on. And when we decided to create this partnership, the Resilient Cities Network reached out um, to all the cities in their network and asked who wanted to prioritize plastic pollution and be part of the Urban Ocean Program. And, um, and so in this case, the cities all self-selected uh, themselves. In the future, if there are cities that are interested, we would like to know about them. I think it's about finding the funding to support it, but we have been able to do that and have been successful with some of the cities in um, this cohort and in the cohort that we intend to launch later this year. So please, if you have questions about that specifically, um, reach out to me and we can discuss it. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, another question that came in, are the people you work with receptive to bioplastics, paper compostable containers, or banning certain types of plastics? I'm just wondering about how to eliminate the sources of future plastic across the world. Jenna, do you have a response from your perspective? And then I can hop in as well. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, yes, and, and in some cases, some of those materials are already available in communities. Um, and, you know, as we're looking at increasing circularity, avoiding waste in the first place is, is the, the highest component. As I've said, the best waste is, is no waste. And so that's why we have that use um, and reuse category as well, um, ways that, you know, waste can be avoided. But then, Next is if you have to have packaging, you know, what material makes the most sense, what's available. Um, absolutely, they are um, open to alternative materials that are maybe more locally sourced. We see a lot of that in Vietnam. Um, biodegradable materials, there is a lot of nuance to that. So we've got, you know, compostable versus sort of the home compostable. If it's only an added compostable at an industrial scale, you need to make sure that infrastructure exists. Um, anyway, so there are some nuances there and some conversation to be had. And in some cases, people are spending more money for something that is compostable, industrial compostable, but then don't have access to that infrastructure. And so 
you know, and that, you know, doesn't biodegrade when leak into the environment. So we're having, and people don't necessarily know that. So we're having conversations like that and people are absolutely open to making change. And then I think uh, potentially eliminating something that's problematic um, or that can be avoided. Yeah, I was just going to, to, to reiterate and also to add, I think cities are completely open to um, all the potential solutions out there. However, what we are seeing is if you have something that's considered bio-based or, um, or um, compostable, it doesn't actually mean that you know it could end up in the environment and it's any better than plastic. So as Jenna was saying, um, a lot of compostable products still need a, a particular type of processing. And so in some cases, that's not a better alternative than what already exists it's about limiting what we have in the system and then finding better ways to manage it so it do doesn't end up in, in streams or in streets and then ultimately leads into the ocean. Bans are in a, a policy solution that some cities are considering, as well as different types of tax incentives. For instance, you know, if you um, if you need a plastic bag, they charge you a small amount of money. Whereas um, in other cases, if you bring your own bag, you might get a, a rebate or a particular type of discount. So those policy solutions are also be, being considered. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, and a question that came in, just sort of following up on what you were just saying, um, did you find any homegrown innovations in the cities to reduce pla uh, packaging and waste? Are there other uh, ones that you want to mention? Um, so for me, when you say homegrown, I'm not exactly sure what they mean. I will say that... Um, um, we I would just guess maybe perhaps context specific um, for the cities. Um, Okay, yeah, sure. So um, so there are some city specific solutions that we lay out in our toolkit, but the ones that I think are the most interesting for me personally are reuse schemes. So um, we have seen in different places in Southeast Asia and actually in, in Latin America and Chile, you have uh, companies that come around and provide opportunities for people to refill basic um, at home products that would typically require going to a supermarket and then buying an entirely new plastic container like shampoos and um, dishwasher solution and um, solutions for, for washing your clothes. And so I really think the local reuse models are really exciting. Um, and then uh, I would also say um, smaller devices to capture litter that could leak into um, sewage drains. So um, also in our toolkit, we talk about things like litter traps and um, and uh, rain gardens. So if there's heavy rain or flooding, it keeps the plastic from um, entering a, a storm drain, causing additional flooding and then more waste ending up mismanaged and eventually leading into our rivers and oceans. I think those are really neat too. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Oh, thank you, Jenna. Um, I was, can I just add a little bit? Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> I know we're getting close on time, but I just wanted to say that's sort of the whole point of looking sort of locally, how kind of local can we get with some of these solutions to increase, you know, the circularity. And for example, I, I kind of alluded to this in Vietnam, but they have um, a specific grass that basically can be used as a straw. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily travel really far, um, although they have a lot of different plants there that, um, you know, it's almost they could have an export economy for, you know, biodegradable and some of this plant based materials. Um, probably not necessarily these straws, but they, but many people, many restaurants locally can use that grass uh, as a straw replacement very easily. And it also provided um, an economic and entrepreneurial space for innovators. And I think as we travel down this road and the cities are looking at that, part of this is really to see what innovators are out there and hopefully sort of incubate those ideas and see if they can be scalable or just even locally applied um, as well. And so I think that's, that was a very good question. Okay, thank you. Um, 
the other there's several questions that uh, pertain to how we reduce production um, there was questions of whether the data um, uh, where cities were manufacturing was farther away where those companies provided the data of their product impact and are there any plans to use the data to reduce production there's also a question whether um, there's potential for extended producer responsibility um, to be brought into play here I was just wondering if you can talk about anything that's being uh, done in terms of reducing production? Uh, so I can go first. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in certain cities is that the loop is already smaller. So for instance, in Panama, um, they don't need to um, necessarily come go get certain plastic products from out of country because they're already produced in country. So that means that working with the producers um, to uh, start an extended producer responsibility strategy might be a little bit less complex than if you're dealing with manufacturers overseas. So we are seeing extended producer responsibility as something that multiple cities would like to explore. And we have um, uh, provided opportunities for the cities to speak with other cities that are already um, instituting EPR schemes. As far as limiting production itself, um, it is a topic. What the solution is, is something that we're still trying to find out because supply follows demand, correct? So we're hoping that if our cities can work with their, um, with just the people who live there as a community to say, this is how we're going to limit the de demand by finding ways to reuse, by finding ways to uh, curb our single-use plastic consumption, then the demand will also go down. Um, I don't know, Jenna or Steve, if you want to hop in on that as far as production. I was just going to, I was just going to quickly comment on how we collected that data because I think the question was, are the manufacturers supplying information and where they're supplying is on the packaging. So we, um, you know, actually looked at the packaging itself and at the brands and and the manufacturer location and parent company and that's how that data is collected and of course i think as the cities decide how what materials they want to be using how you know these communities are the ones that have been burdened with managing this waste and seeing the impact locally and so that's why you know hopefully this data provides power for them to start those conversations and i think carrie articulated that if if they aren't going to use this material, then that production could be reduced based upon the fact that, you know, they're going to eliminate some of those if they are, if they turn out to be unnecessary, avoidable, or problematic. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Um, don't think we have time for any, we do have more questions, but we don't have time for the last ones, but I'll be able to provide them to you guys um, after the webinar. So um, the questions will be seen by the panelists for those of you who submitted questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, just want to say thank you so much for presenting. Um, Carrie, Jenna, and Steve, we appreciate you making the time for this. And um, thank you so much to everyone who attended. We appreciate all the work you're doing um, on plastic waste as well. Um, so thank you all, and we hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, got a lot out of this webinar for your future work. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much also. We look forward to following up with everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, everyone.